offices where maybe an equal number of people are sitting down and watching it. Uh, and uh, it is also being taped. Now, this is a very extraordinary kind of attempt today to have Deva Sobel here, because twice last <laughs> spring when she was scheduled, it was coincident with a sufficiently large snowstorm to close the observatory. Uh, so we're so pleased that we have got her now. Those of you who came for the IT forum over lunch here got a wonderful uh, account given by Deva Sobel of her early days as a science reporter for the New York Times. And uh, so I will continue from where she left off uh, in her biography as a science writer. There was a time when Will Andrews, who was uh, running our historical scientific instruments collection, uh, realized that John Harrison was not being commemorated properly in England, and so decided it should be done here in America. And he proposed to have a symposium or a special congregation working on this. And those of us in the history of science department figured, well, you know, maybe there are 20 people who would be interested in John Harrison and the, his remarkable clocks. What we did not know, but which John, which uh, Will Andrews knew, was that there were hundreds, if not thousands, of people in the Clock and Watch Collectors Association. And he invited them all. Uh, and so there was a big crowd gathering. And Will called me up and said, we're looking for a really good speaker for our banquet. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's fine. I think I could do it. And he said, we're, we're thinking of having Alastair Cook. Uh, do you think you can get the telephone number for him? I said, well, all right, I'll try. I knew the president of WGBH, and he gladly gave me the telephone number and said, good luck. Uh, and now that's a, an essential part of this back story, because... Deva had been interested in the idea that there was this colloquium coming up, a symposium on the early history of navigational clocks. Uh, and she asked various magazines and papers if they were interested in an article. And everybody uh, thought this was way too esoteric and turned her down until Harvard Magazine discovered that Alastair Cook was coming and they realized <laughs> it would be an event. So they quickly got in touch with her and she happily agreed to come and wrote a splendid article about this, uh, these clocks used for longitude. And uh, it was published in Harvard Magazine. And one of the Harvard alums George Gibson, uh, was in the publishing business and saw the article and decided this would make a splendid book. I don't think Deva had any notion of writing a book at that point. <laughs> well, he was very persuasive and a brilliant editor as well. Uh, we've swapped notes on this. He's the kind of editor who filled the margins with comments, but never rewrote anything. And he was the best kind of editor you could have. Longitude, the book that came out, has sold approximately a million copies, counting both America and even more in the United Kingdom. But today, she's going to talk about one of the sub subsequent books, <coughs> Uh, the one that's most recently coming out, uh, the one on the glass universe. 
So rather than stealing more of her time, let me introduce you to Deva Sobel speaking, as you can see, on constructing the glass universe. Deva? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's really great to be back here. Uh, the scene of many happy hours in putting this book together. And since people have asked me how I got the idea, how I went about it, I thought since this is a colloquium where people usually talk about their research, that that's what I would do, tell you the, the story of how this book came together. And uh, this person had a lot to do with it. This is Wendy Friedman. And I was interviewing her for a profile in Omni Magazine when she was in charge of a Hubble Telescope key project about the expansion rate of the universe. And she talked to me about Henrietta Swan Leavitt. And I was even thinking of proposing Miss Leavitt as a brief lives column for Harvard Magazine. And um, Dr. Friedman thought that Henrietta Leavitt's work had been fundamental to what she was doing with the Hubble telescope. And that was really interesting that someone from the previous century had such an impact. And the more I learned about Miss Leavitt, the more I realized that she wasn't the only one, that there was this large group of women here, which was so unexpected uh, from anything I knew about Harvard, uh, <laughs> that I thought, there's really, there's really a story there. Uh, and then, so this, this was more than 20 years ago. The, the germ of the idea started. This picture is far more than 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, let's see if I can... Uh, here is Henrietta Leavitt. And I, I started to see pictures like this. There were a few other inspirational moments. Uh, one was attending a, uh, an American Astronomical Society meeting where there was a round bag lunch about women in astronomy and uh, the idea about women holding up half the sky. Uh, and then Mercury, which was the magazine of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, had a special issue about women in astronomy and, and showed a lot of these historical photographs, which, which just looked wonderfully inviting. Here's another one. And I, I really wanted to approach the subject, but it seemed so problematic. Uh, first of all, a room full of people. Most, most readers want a story with a character who can be followed, a, a single hero or heroine. And then it, it was a story that unfolded over a long period of time. And that's a problem, too. And then uh, there was a lot of science that happened. So um, I, just, I just wasn't sure how I would go about it. But I was, I was thinking about it. I also, uh, through the Dudley Observatory, saw a really interesting art exhibit called A Very Liquid Heaven, which had a section devoted to Henrietta Leavitt. Um, these are not Harvard plates, as you can probably tell. Uh, I think a lot of them may have come from the Dudley Observatory. I don't remember now. But this was, for me, just another little nudge in, in that direction. Uh, so when I started doing research, uh, every, every nonfiction book begins with a proposal. Uh, a writer has to create a document that will convince a publisher to give the writer an advance. So you have maybe a living wage, maybe not, but something to go on while you're writing the book. And the proposal has to be knowledgeable, convincing, 
And so one does a fair amount of research before writing the proposal. And these were some of the books I read. I had found uh, Williamina Fleming's Journal of 1900 online. And that was exciting to know that there really was first-person accounts, uh, at least one first-person account. And um, uh, I was just focusing on, uh, on how I would go about it. Miss Levitt Stars by George Johnson obviously is the story of Henrietta Levitt. And I was struck in that book how little first-person information there was. And I've since learned that she is the one person in the group who left behind no letters, no diaries, no. The only first-person accounts of hers are in her logbooks. That's where she expressed herself, and only in that way, about her work. And so poor George Johnson was reduced to reporting her grades at Radcliffe and uh, <laughs> the addresses of the various places she'd lived, because there just was no uh, really intimate material. Um, and with, with all those characters, I was thinking, maybe Maybe the best way to approach this is as a play. And especially when I saw this picture, I thought, this, this is an opening curtain tableau. I mean, just imagine that. Uh, I spent at least a year imagining that. That's, you, you probably know all these people. This is Margaret Harwood. This is Antonia Mori. Annie Cannon. Cecilia Payne, those are the most famous ones. Um, so, uh, but my, um, my experience, I had written a play, and, uh, oops, yeah, and uh, it was a play about Copernicus, and I had a, a wonderful time here one night at an open night where Owen agreed to take the part of Copernicus wearing the blue velvet scholar's robes that had been made for him in Poland when he received an important honor there. Uh, and I was Redicus, and we had this wonderful photograph of Copernicus's church as our background. Um, but my agent was really not in favor of my writing another play. You, um, you can't get an advance for writing a play. It's, it's, really, it's really a no-win proposition in terms of earning money. And you know, if I'm not earning money, the agent isn't earning money. So <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't like the idea of a play. And uh, furthermore, I discovered there already was a play. Uh, this is from one of the many, many, many productions of The Silent Sky. Uh, I've not ever seen a production. I have read the play, and I was struck by how many liberties were taken. But, you know, that's the thing about plays, novels, movies. You don't really have to hew too closely to the facts. And when I heard the title of The Silent Sky, I thought, well, Miss Levitt was deaf. It must be about that. But in the play, she's not deaf. In, in the play, she's, she's quite musical, and she has her epiphany about periods and luminosities through a, a, a musical uh, connection. And um, uh, there's only one male character in the play. He's not Pickering. He's, he's some kind of amalgamation. And of course, he's the love interest, which, as far as anyone knows, she never had. But um, so I, I abandoned the, the play idea and thought um, there, there, must, there must be a way to tell this story. And one of the things that struck me from the beginning was not only was there the room full of women, but the money for the projects was coming from female philanthropists. So it, um, when a story gets more and more interesting, the more you look into it, you know you're in the right place. And uh, 
This is Anna Palmer Draper as a young woman. Uh, she, she also appears in this picture, seated in the, um, uh, the computing room when it was part of the observatory, before the brick building was constructed. And uh, her story really appealed to me. Here was somebody who got interested enough in the work here to support it for three decades and also to provide for it in her will. She had tremendous foresight. Uh, she was married to this man, uh, Dr. Henry Draper. He really was trained as a medical doctor, and he was a surgeon in the Union Army, but a very committed, serious amateur astronomer, and built some of the finest telescopes of his day. And uh, when he and Anna married, they, one of the first things they did was to go buy a big piece of glass for him to build his 28-inch telescope. And they called that their wedding trip. Um, and so they were partners in astronomy. They, she worked as his assistant. She was independently wealthy, which he was not so she could support his interest. And uh, uh, their, their life together really got the, uh, one of the projects here going. Because um, as soon as uh, Henry succeeded in taking the first photograph of the spectrum of a star, he knew that was really terribly important and decided to give up teaching at NYU. He was teaching chemistry uh, and really devote himself to photographing the spectra of the stars and uh, creating a taxonomy, a stellar classification system. He was just thrilled with spectroscopy. He said that spectral analysis had made the chemist's arms millions of miles long because you know, no one thought it would be possible before that to, to ever figure out what the stars were made of. So um, he was going to devote himself to that. And just when they had everything in order to, um, to turn their lives totally in that direction, he developed pneumonia and died at age 45. And so uh, she made an arrangement with Pickering, who was a friend of theirs, that she would provide the money if he would do the work in her husband's name. And that was what, she tripled the operating budget of the observatory at a stroke. Um, so this is, this is starting down at the bottom, is an obituary of Mrs. Draper who I'm happy to say lived a long life and really saw the project make tremendous progress. She lived till 1914. And Annie Jump Cannon wrote her obituary. And this was one of the things I read uh, while I was trying to come up with my proposal. And in the obituary, she talked about a wonderful dinner party that the Drapers had thrown in, in New York at their Madison Avenue mansion. Uh, to entertain the members of the National Academy of Sciences when they were meeting in New York City. And I could just see that scene. And uh, so I started the proposal with that scene and then talked about the various characters. And, uh, and I got very good reaction to my proposal. A couple of publishers were interested and uh, I went with Penguin Random House because I uh, really knew the people there over many years and felt they would be the best to work with. And then I started visiting places that were important in the story. So this is the um, observatory cottage in Hastings on Hudson where the Drapers had their observatory. Uh, the first place I visited. This is what it looked like 
uh, in their day. This is from about 1880. Of course, uh, doesn't look like that anymore. The dome was destroyed by fire. And the headquarters, uh, the, the cottage, became the residence of many of the uh, Draper descendants. Henry and Anna had no children, but his brothers and sisters used the cottage and some of their children. And the building is now the headquarters of the Hastings Historical Society. And they were very helpful providing information, photographs. But they didn't have too many of the Draper's papers. And the papers were mostly at the New York Public Library. And that was fascinating to go through Henry Draper's letters because he was like Forrest Gump. He wrote to everybody. He had correspondence with Simon Newcomb and Asaph Hall and Thomas Edison, Joseph Henry. Uh, and everybody wrote back to him. I mean, it wasn't just that he wrote to them. There was <laughs> correspondence. And, uh, and, and Mrs. Draper uh, was a, a generous donor to the library as well. And so there are a lot of photographs there, um, progress of building things here at Harvard, some of the buildings that housed the Draper's telescope, all telescopes, because Mrs. Draper gave several telescopes to the Harvard Observatory. Um, this is uh, another picture of Draper Park because it was Antonia Mori's dream, she being Henry Draper's niece and a person who had grown up at the Hastings site. Um, she wanted to make the place a park where people could learn about science. And she bought this Alvin Clark telescope for the purpose of instructing the youth of Hastings on Hudson in astronomy. And uh, she also had plans to teach them all about the botany and geology of the area. And she, um, she had a lot of trouble with it. There were amateur astronomers who helped build a, a firm uh, platform and shed for the telescope. But the plans for the park never really gelled. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that a current resident of Hastings has taken that on, and it, it may yet happen. So um, this is Antonia Mori when she was a student at Vassar College, graduating class of 1887. So she was the first woman who came here as a computer who had a college education. And uh, here is a close-up from the very famous photograph of the computers. Uh, it's probably a staged picture um, in, for many reasons, partly I mean, Tom Klein, who is here and has spent more time than anyone looking at all these pictures and figuring out what's going on. It's unlikely they were that crowded together uh, when they worked and that all the window shades are drawn. So there would be no way they could have used the little light frames in which they examine the plates. And really, what is she looking at through this magnifying glass? I, I don't know. But here on the back is uh, her, her curve for the spectroscopic binary that, that she discovered. So she worked with Pickering on the discovery of uh, the one in Mizar. But then this, this was her own discovery. And for a long time, I thought, maybe the whole book could be carried by Antonia Mori. Maybe she is the main character because she came in very early and she lived till 1952. So she was present for a lot of the story. And then she was Henry Draper's niece. And she was the only one who ever really had conflict with Pickering. She was very... Um, he made her very nervous and uncomfortable, and she would often leave for a year or two at a time and then be drawn back by her love of the work. And, uh, and she was just slow working on her classification system, and he got impatient with her. Even Mrs. Draper got impatient with her, and they were just pushing her to 
get the thing done. But it just took her a long time. She, she had the best spectra to work with. She had the very large ones made with her Uncle Henry's 11-inch telescope. So she saw a lot in those spectra, and she wasn't going to rush through it. Um, uh, many of the Draper family papers are at the Library of Congress, which is a really exalted and almost intimidating place. But um, I just want all the, uh, especially young people in the room, to know that there is no particular entree required to gain access to the Library of Congress. If you want to do research there, you just have to be at least 16 years old and be interested in something. That's it. The place is yours. Um, the part where I worked was not the glamorous part. <laughs> But it was really interesting to go through the papers, find actual letters from Antonia Mori to her aunts in Hastings. And um, uh, many papers also of Mrs. Draper's, including the guest list for the November 15th, 1882 dinner for the National Academy of Sciences. Because I had heard that Thomas Edison was present but I couldn't really prove it, but there was his name on the guest list. So then, then I knew I really had it. And it's interesting how different archives have different rules and different codes. So in the Library of Congress, I was searched every time I went out of the room. I had to turn out my pockets, which doesn't happen in the Harvard archives. Uh, <laughs> And what could I have had in my pocket? I, I still don't understand that, but that, that was the code of ethics there. So um, top, this is the uh, reading room and the university archives where people were just so accommodating. It was, um, it was a great experience working there. My only complaint was that the hours were so short. I mean, it's open from 11 to 4, Monday to Friday, which means you've got to just get in there right at 11 and not take a break. Just go, go, go till 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock, rather. And, uh, but then after a day in the archives, I could go up to the Wallback Library. I realize now this is a historic photo <laughs> because <laughs> I went in there yesterday, and all the furniture was different. And uh, especially, there was, there was one study carol where, and it happened to be located right near the bookshelves. No more bookshelves. The bookshelves where all the annals of the observatory were kept. There was a study carol where you could stand up at the desk, which is my preferred way of working. And they, the librarians at the Wallback would tease me that they were going to put a plaque for me on that carol. Uh, but they did something better than that, because the Wallback closes at 5 o'clock. So you still don't have that much time. And it's not open to non-Harvard people uh, on the weekends. So they created a kind of internship position for me, which got me an ID card that I could go into the library whenever I wanted. So I'm forever grateful to them for doing that. Uh, and of course, I worked in the plate stacks. When I started here, Alison Doan was still uh, present and uh, very, very helpful and enthusiastic. And now we have Lindsay Smith, who was just as, if not more, helpful and enthusiastic. And, uh, and then there were all the people working on the digitization project. So um, where, wherever I went with this story, I found people really happy that the story was being told and, and ready to do anything to make my life easier, which 
which was really great. And, and thank you all. You know who you are. Uh, one of the lucky things for me was at the time I was writing the book, I had a writer-in-residence visiting professor position at Smith College. Uh, this is the old Smith College Observatory, which no longer exists. The astronomy de department now operates from the roof of one of the science buildings. But um, some of the, the Smith people were seriously involved here. Uh, most importantly, Priscilla Fairfield, later Priscilla Fairfield Bach. And um, in reading her correspondence, she, she would go back and forth. She would come here almost every weekend. She would be here for the summers. And when she was at Smith, she would write to Shapley about their work together. And uh, they had a, a big back and forth. And she almost always wrote to him on Smith College Observatory stationery. But one time, she wrote to him from home. And so at the bottom of the letter, she put her home address. And it was the address of the building where I was living. <laughs> I mean, if I ever, if I had any doubt that I was not pursuing the right story, that, <laughs> what a moment that was. You know, it's an old apartment building. So I knew it wasn't, it was the same building. And there were only 10 apartments. So, you know, the odds that, that I was in her apartment were not, they were fairly good. Uh, and even if I hadn't been in her apartment, her, her ghost was just everywhere. It was, <laughs> was fabulous. Um, so uh, I abandoned the idea of, of hinging the story on Antonia Mori because um, to, toward the end of her life, she, she was very lonely and unhappy. And I, I didn't want the story to end that way. And I, I had come to realize that the glass plates really were the main character in the story, that the plates made everything possible. And, uh, and that's what gave me the idea for the title, The Glass Universe, because that's what the plates seem to be to me, the whole universe in glass. And of course, that was an intentional play on the phrase, the glass ceiling, uh, which, which has come around to bite me, because many people think the title of the book is The Glass Ceiling. They talk about it, including my editor, who has done it so many times now that I throw up my hands. Um, so the blank page. Um, I think the, the thing that I, uh, most people f have a fear of the blank page or the blank screen. Um, some people say to me, I wish I had time to write. You know, which always strikes me as they think it's some kind of pleasant hobby. But it's, you know, it, it really is a full-time job. And um, uh, the biggest problems are, are the, very the very beginning. You know, what, what is the structure of this story? Once, once I had my, my characters, my, my idea that it was going to be the plates and all the people who worked on them. Um, uh, what is the structure? What does it sound like? You know, what is the tone of voice of this story? And, uh, and where does it begin? And uh, that dinner party, that just, that had made a good beginning for the proposal, and it seemed like it would work as a beginning for the story for the book as a whole. And um, I, I, I try to think of a person to tell a story to for each book, that that answers a lot of questions for me about how much do I have to explain and uh, when is there too much explanation, too much science. If I have a person in mind, that just 
settles things. Besides, it's very anxiety provoking to think about writing for the general public, you know, a big scowling group of people. Um, uh, nice to have a friendly face in mind. And uh, the structure came together pretty quickly because, and chronologically. And, um, and then the, the voice of the story. I was very influenced by the tone of the letters. I spent a lot of time reading the correspondence between Pickering and Mrs. Draper. They were writing to each other several times a week for 30 years. And he really explained to her frequently exactly what was going on. She really had a background in the subject. And she was intensely interested in everything that went on. And um, they had this wonderful formality. So all that time, and they, they visited. She came here. You've seen a picture of her in the plate stacks. He went to see her in New York. They vacationed together. In all those years, they never arrived at a first name basis. <laughs> he was always my dear Professor Pickering, and she was always my dear Mrs. Draper. And I thought, that is the sound of the book, at least at the beginning. It has to have that kind of 19th century politeness. And, um, and so that's, I just followed that. Um, the other thing about creating a story like this is there are about a million really interesting things that you can't really put in the story without getting too distracted. Arthur Cyril is really a great character. He and his brother, who also worked here but was a priest and, uh, uh, and, and left to, to work in the church, and that's how Arthur Searle came and took his place. He had done all kinds of odd jobs before coming here and then wound up spending the rest of his life here. They're, they're, I think they would make a fascinating biography. But I, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't get distracted and say too much about them. But that is an ongoing problem in writing a book, is just to stick to the story and not get diverted by all the many interesting things that you discover along the way. Um, this, is, um, this is something um, that amused me to do. I, you know, finding the right word is really important. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And then if I've got what I think is just the right word, I don't want to overuse it. So I started just making a little concordance as I was working. And when I got a word uh, that I thought might call attention to itself or might get overused, I would just put it in my list. And uh, next to it, I would write the number of the chapter where I used it. And uh, this document got to be more than 50 pages, single space. <laughs> kind of a craziness. But it was very helpful, too, because sometimes when I needed to get back to this part or one part or another, I could remember a word. I wouldn't remember what chapter I'd written about that topic in, but I would remember that, that the word alarming, say, was in chapter 14. And then, you know, that, that word was about that topic. So anyway, so this just kind of a writer's neurosis, giving you an inside <laughs> look at what part of the process is. Um, and a lot of rewriting. Uh, writing is about rewriting. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> um, I mentioned before that there was already a play about Miss Levitt. So there was, all, there was another play that went on in New York that I didn't even hear about while it was running was called Insignificant. And it was about all these same female characters from the Harvard Observatory. And it was put on in a very clever way with 
a woman astronomer, different one at each, I think it was a different one at each performance, but anyway, there was always an astronomer at the performance there to answer questions afterward in an audience talkback. And it was so successful that the uh, producer is turning it into a web series, which will also be called Insignificant. Uh, and I, um, I hope they're doing okay with it. I had thought it would come out long before now, but it, but it hasn't. Um, new, new images of the ladies have come out as a result of my book. This, this was from the review in The Economist. I really like this. I just, um, I just think it, it captures something. I don't know. Um, uh, it's, I, I'm happy to say the book has already been translated into a few other languages, uh, one of which is Italian. This is the Italian jacket. Um, they've made, Hen this is, a, believe it or not, this is Henrietta Leavitt. I don't know where they got this picture, but um, I'm usually not consulted on jacket design. Certainly not by foreign publishers, but I'll, I'll go along with that. Um, the, other, the other thing that happens after you've written a book is that people know that you're the person interested in that subject. And things that you tried to find out beforehand but couldn't suddenly come to you. Uh, so uh, uh, a fellow named... Uh, uh, Paul Haley in the UK, uh, who is very interested in Williamina Fleming and has written an article about her for uh, a journal. I'm going to forget the name of it now. Um, but it's about history. It's not the journal for the history of astronomy, but it is a journal about astronomy <coughs> history. And um, I'd always known that Mrs. Fleming made dolls. And she sometimes sold them to raise money for worthy causes. Uh, she made dolls for the families at Arequipa in Peru. And uh, here is one of her dolls in Highland costume. Um, Haley also uh, put identifications on photographs that have been in the Harvard University archives, but where people have not been able to identify all the characters. So this is Williamina Fleming. This is Ida Woods. I think that's Florence Cushman. Um, these are the Gill sisters. And this person, according to Paul Haley, is Mrs. Fleming's son, Edward, of whom there are no pictures anywhere that anyone knows of. He. Um, uh, she was pregnant when she came to work here. You probably know this story, but I'll, I'll go over it quickly. Uh, so she, that's why she took a job as a maid, uh, because she was in desperate straits. And Pickering moved her into the observatory, taught her how to compute and do plate analysis, and then helped her go home to Scotland to have her baby, and promised her a real job if she would come back. So she left the baby with her mother and grandmother. She named him Edward Charles Pickering Fleming. <laughs> and uh, he stayed, the son stayed in Scotland till he was seven years old when her mother moved here with him. And um, she managed to put him through MIT. So he went on to be a successful mining engineer. Um, but uh, Tom Fine is not convinced, right? right? We're not convinced it's really Edward Pickering. I mean, Edward Fleming. There is a passport photo. Oh. Oh, I didn't know about the passport photo. OK, all right, well, so uh, maybe, maybe not. And there are other women in some of the photographs of the groups of computers who've been identified by Paul Haley, but we don't, re we don't really know. Um, so uh, Henrietta Leavitt is often called the unsung heroine. 
and uh, there, there still you often hear that she was never credited for what she did, which is really not true. And uh, I know Josh Grindley is here, and he is the person who started the campaign a few years ago to call the period luminosity relation the Levitt Law. And that, that is gaining traction. I try to mention it every time I speak to anybody about this book or these characters. And um, uh, she was considered for a Nobel Prize, but unfortunately not till after her death, so that uh, never happened. But when Shapley received the letter uh, from the person interested in nominating her, he, uh, he wrote back a very generous letter in admiration of her work and saying how much her work had helped him in his own research. And he also asked permission to tell her family, about, since she was not going to get the prize, that to just let her mother and brother know how highly she'd been regarded. Uh, and. Um, to conclude, I, I would like to try something here that may not work at all. Do you want me to leave that open? Can I leave her picture up? No, it's too late. Okay. So, um, you know, she's, she's an unsung heroine, but uh, uh, an amateur astronomer named Kate St. John, who's very interested in unsung heroines, uh, put together a concert called uh, Nobody Knew She Was There. And it's about several women in history who didn't get the credit they deserved. And so Henrietta Levitt is one of those people. And Kate sent me an MP3 of her song about Henrietta Levitt, which I'm going to try to play for you. And we'll see if this little microphone will pick it up. It's called Angel of Harvard. It's silent up there in the void. And it's silent Celestial bodies drift slowly by as calculations unfold into galactic distances, light years and places beyond. I fashioned a yardstick. For the universe by my design, a magic wand. Oh, what a bit of starlight can do to you as you gaze far up at the skies. There's no other place like the Milky Way. Unlock its secrets, unlock its signs. 2,400 stars I discovered in so little time. And on like that. So I'd be happy to share that with anybody. I know she, um, she has given me permission. All right, do you have any questions? Maybe not. <laughs> Just one.
what happened to the glass lens that they first made together? The drapers. Oh, the drapers. Um, I believe it's here, the, the 28 inch. Isn't it here? It's, it's now as part of the scale exhibition, but it's usually up in the dump. The mirror. Totally trivial question. <clears throat> totally trivial question. I was curious. In the 1980s, did everyone, excuse me, 1880s, did people keep copies of every letter they wrote? The question is, in the in the 1880s, did people keep copies? Now, these are the actual letters. So, so both parties. Well, Hickering saved Mrs. Draper's letters. And she saved his letters. Yes. Well, his letters are letterpress copies. The observatory was meticulous about documenting everything. No letter left here, even if they were just ordering a bottle of ink. It's in, it's in the letters of that year. Um, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, so the, they would just press a piece of tissue paper wet moist paper over the letter and have a copy of it. And some of those years of those letterpress copies are just completely falling apart. Or the ink has eaten through the paper. But some of them are in pretty good shape. So, um, so you can read all of his correspondence to everyone. Another really interesting thing about Pickering's correspondence is how serious he was about answering everybody's letters. And he got just as many crank letters as you do. <laughs> and sometimes he, he was said, crazy. <laughs> and he answered uh, queries from from students, from I individuals who were just interested in astronomy, and would write to him with a question. He would take the time to write back. And uh, sometimes for the really wacko things, he would say. I am putting your theory on file in the university archives. And it's there. <laughs> there was somebody way over there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any like other research that you might want to pursue or if what you sort of discovered this whole endeavor brought up even more questions. Um, do I want to pursue more about this particular history? Either Here. that or oh, there are other... Okay, well sometimes, sometimes in the process of working on a book, the idea for something else comes up. And unfortunately for me, that didn't happen this time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little at sea, uh, looking, looking for, for a next uh, project. Okay, do you... So the Merrimack Repertory Theater in Lowell yes. is going to be producing the Silent Sky. Silent Sky. And I meant to give them a plug. In about two weeks they start. Yeah, the Merrimack Theater in Lowell is is the next group to produce the Silent Sky. And it's on right here in Cambridge on October 18th. I oh, at the okay. Central, Central Square Theater. Oh, and they're doing it again. That was just they, a, that was a, a pre-production run that we saw last spring. Oh, that's the women who map the stars. Yeah, this that's is another play about them. Yeah, it's a good yeah. one. It, but it, it also has somebody saying it's good. Yeah, yeah I good. went to the okay. meeting too, and it's, okay. I, I think it, I saw both of them close together, and the new one, the women who map the stars, is more historically accurate. It's, it's more historical. Yeah. Some people like Owen and Joss might think, not think it's perfect. Um, but but I liked it. I think it portrayed the women better, and um, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for reminding me to say that. Well, thank you very much. That was just beautiful. Um, so you've given us a lot of insight, even into things that didn't make it into the book necessarily. I just wondered if you had a maybe a short story you wanted to tell us about something that you didn't get to put in the book, but that really meant <laughs> no. something to you. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I thought the things that were really important and that meant something to me, of course I would put those in. Um, and people were hoping I would discover scandal. <laughs> um, yeah, people were discreet. If, if there was scandalous behavior, they didn't talk about it. Um, in, in Mrs. Fleming's journal of 1900, 
she really gives the day of the day. And there, there were a couple of days where one of, one of the women had a fit of hysteria and had to be sent home in a carriage. Mm -hmm. This is all. You can read this. Um, Pickering, all, maybe this is what I'll mention, is Pickering also submitted a journal to the chest of 1900. This was a time capsule project, and various people on campus were invited to write up what they did day to day. And uh, uh, so both Mrs. Fleming and Pickering wrote about their experiences in the observatory. And Pickering wrote a lot about his leisure activities and uh, how, how he'd spend Saturday afternoon with his mother and um, the kinds of books he liked to read with his wife. And he also talked about the mail and how much time it took him to deal with the mail. And mail came two or three times a day. And so he would talk about how he and Mrs. Fleming worked with the mail. And at one point, I hope I'm quoting him correctly, because I, I didn't put this in the book because I had so many other things from him that were better. But he said that you know, Mrs. Fleming could be very critical of the way. So sometimes he just let her write the letters. <laughs> if you're really determined to see these letters, I have copies of those from the chess in my office. Oh, so you can come by and borrow them. Oh, there's Charles. a resource. I wonder if you could kind of give us a bit of social context. When Pickering started hiring these women, was that a totally novel thing to have done, or were there other areas where women could come together and do interesting work? So was, was Pickering doing something completely novel? Mm -hmm. When he arrived here, he found six women already working here. So it wasn't that he initiated the practice. And uh, so some of them were family. Most of them, five of them, were family of the resident astronomers. And only one had been hired from outside. And that was because the others were doing such a good job. It was obvious that women could do the work. And then he, being very practical, when he had money to do this giant photography project, and he would need, he sometimes referred to the people as readers, like each plate was a book, and he needed people to read them. Um, it was just more efficient to hire women that, because they were cheaper. So he could get a, a, a larger staff, and that would move the project along. I also thought it was interesting what Mariah Mitchell said, because sometimes people think the women were given these jobs because women are somehow more capable of doing boring work or tedious work or very closely detailed work. Um, but Arthur Searle made the point that astronomy was tedious and difficult and a little bit like bookkeeping. Um, but Mariah Mitchell argued that, in fact, that being trained to do needlework was excellent pro, pro, uh, preparation for astronomy. That she had this great line that the, the eye that could trace the delicate patterns of embroidery could bisect a star with the spider thread. And she thought, that women were particularly suited. Can I have a follow-up question? Yes, because maybe wondering. I didn't answer your question. No, you didn't, but it's okay, you answered a different question okay. very well. Um, <laughs> I just wondered, was there an equivalent group? I mean, this was, I think, about the time of Bunsen. So when people, actual chem, chemical spectroscopy was a big project. Um, were, were there comparable enclaves of women classifying spectra or doing something in another not side that that I, of the screen, or was astronomy a uh, singularity? Well, I don't know that it was astronomy or it, it was the situation here of the, the, the very collegial atmosphere, the, the way I mean, the, the director lived in the observatory. So it, it was a place people gathered. And then they really did socialize on Saturday nights. Um, and then just the, the fact of the uh, astronomers families being roped into doing the work uh, created this unusual position. And then from here, 
women left positions here and went to work at other observatories. And when Miss Cannon traveled, she would always note that there, there weren't female assistants at the observatory she visited. Um, you speak about how today people are trying to elevate, properly so, the contributions that these women made. But in the time in which they worked, did they feel underappreciated, or did they feel that their, their role was well appreciated? I think these women felt extremely well appreciated. Um, Pickering always credited them, always mentioned everybody's name who had worked on something. Uh, Miss Mori was the first one to get her name on the title page of the annals when she finally finished her, uh, her study. Um, but even before that, he would, when Mrs. Fleming's public, uh, classification was published, she didn't get her name on the title page, but there was a preface that said that she had done all the work. So he was always giving them credit. Then they got recognition. Uh, Mrs. Fleming was made a foreign member of the Royal Astronomical Society, as was Anna Cannon later. Um, they were uh, members of the American Astronomical Society. Miss Cannon was an officer. Uh, so they, she, she got an honorary degree from Oxford University. All kinds of accolades came to them. And just the, the recognition they got from their fellow researchers in astronomy. There too, the correspondence is, so many astronomers would write to her as, as the Henry Draper catalog was in process, people would want to know, have you done this star yet? I know it hasn't been published, but could you tell me something? <coughs> she would write back. So I think they felt totally appreciated. I think it's not a case of they didn't get credit. It's more a case of they've been forgotten. And a lot of myths have grown up around them. You know, the famous myth about Pickering dressing down some assistant whose work was sloppy and saying, my maid could do a better job. That, I would bet anything, that's <coughs> never happened. Because Pickering was the most polite person who ever lived. <laughs> and the thought that he would embarrass a young person in front of others, just it could not have happened. Ms. Cannon was the treasurer of the uh, American Astronomical Society. There's a question back there. Um, to, just to add into this picture, but do I remember correctly that at Harvard, women did not go to the telescope until maybe in the 20s or, or maybe in the teens or something. Um, I, one of the reasons I sort of remember that is because in your book, there's this wonderful picture of Annie Cannon on a horse when she was down in Peru to actually do some observing. So uh, am I remembering right that there was this distinction? When she came, which was 1896, she did telescope observing right away. Repeat the question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, were the women prohibited from, from telescope observing until the 1920s? She was not, before that, nobody had. And I think, not that they were prohibited, but they didn't have the background, the training. She came with the right background. So she was already experienced enough. And so she was doing both. And then later, other people learned how to do it. Um, Cecilia Payne did some of her own plates. Uh, and then Annie Cannon went to Peru. Margaret Harwood also went to Peru. Andrea? Currently, we uh, always say the women could be hired because they were cheaper, and we could hire lots, and we do it in women hours, and things like that. Were the women ever conscious of this? I mean, was there ever any discussion that, you know, look how much I've done, and look at, I'm a member of the Royal Society, but I'm only getting paid 25 cents an hour, whereas someone else is, you know, getting a higher salary. Is there any discussion of that in the letters? Is there any discussion in the letters of the women's dissatisfaction with their low pay. Yes. In Mrs. Fleming's chest of 1900, she goes on at some length about how unhappy she is with her salary. 
and how the director expects her to do everything, which she did. Uh, and uh, she said, I, I think he just isn't aware of what he's getting for $1,500 a year. Did she ever talk to the director year? about that? Yes. Is there any, just, oh, there yeah, is. She and says, how does the director feel about that? She says that? she went to talk to him about it, and he said that her salary was very good. For a <laughs> yeah. And she doesn't feel that that's true. But, and, and her, her conclusion was, and this is considered an enlightened age. <laughs> But you know we're still we're still having to make those complaints. So, well, the time has come to uh, say goodbye. <laughs>